Hi there. So I'd like to talk to you now about chapter 16 um, on composites. And this will be our last online lecture given by me for this semester. So yay! Um, here you see some images of some common uh, composites that you've probably come in contact with before. Uh, concrete here on the left and fiberglass here on the right. So they're really common building materials. And so it's important that you be familiar with them. So a composite is defined as a combination of two or more individual materials. And composites can be natural or synthetic. An example of a natural composite is shown here. The bone in our body is actually a composite material. So is wood, by the way. Anyway, bone is made from a hard and brittle material called hydroxyapatite, which is mainly calcium phosphate, and a soft and flexible material called collagen, which is a protein. Now the design goal, goal for composites is to obtain a more desirable combination of properties. This is actually called the principle of combined action, when you combine um, properties of two different materials to become a better, more desirable combination for whatever you're trying to do. For example, you might want a low density material that's also high strength, like say for example a carbon fiber composite. Now, composites are multi-phase materials, and a lot of them now are artificially made for um, various structures and building materials. You have two phase types, at least, in a composite material. You have your matrix, and that's your continuous material that kind of binds it all together. And then you have your dispersed material. It's discontinuous, and it's surrounded by the matrix. The purposes of your matrix phase are to transfer stress to the dispersed phase, which is usually your strong material, and it also protects the dispersed phase from the environment. So some typical examples are metal matrix composites, or MMCs, ceramic matrix composites, composites or CMCs, and polymer matrix composites, or PMCs. The dispersed phase can serve a variety of purposes. It can increase your yield strength increase your tensile strength, or increase resistance to creep. It can also increase your fracture toughness, or increase your elastic modulus. It comes in three types. They can be particles, fibers, or structure, structural uh, for the dispersed phase. Here's some of the classification um, of these composites. So of the three that I already said, the particle reinforced, the fiber reinforced, or the structural composite, they can have subdivisions. So under particle reinforced, you can have your large particles, um, like, a, uh, like a cement, for example, or a concrete in cement. Or it can be dispersion strengthened um, with small particles that are in the order of 10 to 100 nanometers. Your fiber reinforced can be continuous, which means long fibers, and they can be aligned. Or they can be discontinuous fibers, meaning that they can be very short. And among the discontinuous, they can be either aligned or randomly oriented. And your structural composites fall under two broad categories, the laminates and the sandwich panels, which we'll talk more about later. So here's some examples of your um, particle reinforced. So at top here, we have one that we kind of already covered, the spheroidite steel. So that one has the matrix of the ferrite, which is the alpha phase, and it's more ductile. And then the particles are cementite, and those are brittle and hard. So in this case, your matrix um, being embedded with these little cementite particles, the cementite particles themselves actually act as barriers to slip, um, which makes the material harder than the alpha phase would be by itself. The next example here is uh, as the cemented carbide. This is actually often called a ceramic metal composite or a cermet. Um, the one shown here is a large particle, um, and here you have your tungsten carbide particles in your cobalt matrix. In this case, your tungsten carbide um, particles are very brittle and hard, whereas your matrix, the cobalt, cobalt is more ductile and tough. Now, in particular, this, um, uh, this composite is often used for cutting steels. Um, the tungsten carbide particles are really brittle and hard. If you tried to cut the steel with just the tungsten carbide without being in the matrix, though, it would probably fracture because it is so brittle. And so the cobalt provides um, ductility and toughness to the material that prevents fracture. And then here at the bottom, there's automobile tire rubber, which is 
uh, a matrix of rubber, which is compliant and uh, sort of springy material, combined with carbon black. Carbon black is what you get when you burn hydrocarbons, and it forms these little almost spherical particles that are small. This is example here, the automobile tire, tire rubber is an example of the dispersion strengthened um, composite because you can see here these little carbon black particles are very small. What happens is when you add the carbon black to the rubber, the tire becomes a lot more tough and resistant to tears and uh, a lot harder material than it would be without the carbon black. Oftentimes tires are about 15 to 30 percent by weight um, carbon black material. Another really common <clears throat> material that we talk about is concrete in terms of uh, composite materials. I've actually posted several videos about concrete because it is one of the more important and commonly used composite materials on the planet. So concrete is not the same as cement. Um, concrete is actually a mixture of a gravel and sand and cement. So concrete is gravel, sand, cement, and water and the sand and gravel actually fill the voids between the gravel particles. You can reinforce concrete with steel rebar or remesh and that increases the strength so that even if the cement matrix cracks over time, the material still stays strong and supports the load. You can also pre-stress your concrete by putting a rebar or a remesh and placing it under tension while the concrete sets. And then the, ten the release of tension after setting places the concrete in a constant state of compression, which makes it stronger. And to fracture concrete, an applied tensile stress has to exceed the compressive stress that it's already in. You can also post-tension it by putting nuts um, on the ends to place the concrete under compression. Now moving on to um, the particle reinforced uh, formulae for the elastic modulus. You can see here that the elastic modulus E um, for the composite with the subscript sub C can be put between an upper and a lower limit. Okay, um, And this is actually known as the rule of mixtures. Um, between then it says that your your material property for your matrix, your sub M here, your M subscript here, and your particulate P, the P subscript here, um, is actually going to be a mixture. And it will fall between the upper limit equation here, E sub C is equal to VM times EM plus VT, VP times EP. Here, V stands for the volume fraction, um, and E stands for the modulus, as I said. And then the lower limit expression is 1 over EC is equal to VM over EM plus VP over EP. And so you can see here the expressions for the upper and lower limits are shown here in red and blue. And the values, the actual values for this composite material fall in between um, the upper and the lower limits according to the rule of mixtures. This um, expression can also be applied to other properties, not just the modulus, for example, but it could be used to express the electrical conductivity, where you in, in replace the E's in the equation with the sigmas for the conductivity, or the thermal conductivity, K, where you replace the E's with K's. So it gives you a good expression, um, general expression, for estimating what the material properties of the composite would be. Now the next classification of composites is actually technologically probably one of the most important types of composites and that's fiber reinforced composites. And fibers are very, very strong in tension, so they provide significant strength improvement to the composite. For example, you might be familiar with fiberglass, which is continuous glass filaments in a polymer matrix. And there the glass fibers provide strength and stiffness, while the polymer matrix holds the fibers in place, protects the fiber surfaces, and transfers load to the fibers. You can have different fiber types. Um, one is whiskers, which are thin single crystals with large length to diameter ratios. And some examples of those are graphite, silicon nitride, silicon carbide. There's also some of those that are being applied to nanotechnology where you have uh, carbon fiber and carbon nanotube uh, whisker type fibers. They have a high crystalline perfection, these whiskers. They're extremely strong. In fact, they're the strongest known. However, they can be very expensive and they can be difficult to disperse. You can also have fiber fiber types, which are polycrystalline or amorphous, and those are generally polymers or ceramics. For example, alumina, aramid, um, glass, boron, 
ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, those are all fibers that can be used in these composites. And then finally you can have wire fiber types. Those are metals like steel, molybdenum, and tungsten. And those provide strong resistance to creep. The way the fibers are aligned really dictates a lot of their performance. Um, there's two types. There's the aligned continuous or the discontinuous. Remember the continuous are the long fibers, very long fibers. They're about 30 times the critical length, which is a property that we'll get to in a minute. And these continuous fibers, because they are long, they basically have to be aligned in the longitudinal direction. So here you have longitudinally aligned fibers. The performance of these aligned continuous fibers can be very different depending upon which direction the stress is applied. If it's applied in the longitudinal direction, they'll be much, much stronger than if the stress is applied in the transverse direction. For the discontinuous or short fibers, you can either have aligned or random orientation of the fibers. You might want random orientation if you're not really sure what direction the stress is going to be applied in, or if it's just as likely the stress could come from any direction. Here's some examples of the fiber reinforced composites, some images of what they might look like. For example, here's the metal wires type composite, and you can see here that you have these metal fibers embedded in a metal matrix, and that provides a strong resistance to creep and also more strength. You can also have um, here a, an example of ceramic uh, with glass with silicon carbide whisker fibers, and that's formed by a glass slurry. And you can see that there's actually a pretty big spread in between the elastic modulus for the glass or for the silicon carbide. And so you would get a much stronger and um, much higher elastic modulus for the material when you mix those fibers in. Here's some examples of some discontinuous fibers. <clears throat> this one shows an example of carbon fibers embedded in a polymer resin matrix. Um, these can be used in disc brakes, gas turbine engine flaps, and missile nose cones. I've actually posted another external video on carbon fibers because they are one of the more important new types of composites out there, and I encourage you to watch that. Also, you could have the fibers aligned in the plane, or they could be aligned randomly in three dimensions, or they could be aligned. So in the images that's shown here, this is uh, random in two dimensions, but aligned along the plane. Now the length of the fiber that you use um, is very, very important for the fiber's performance. So there's something called the critical fiber length for effective stiffening and strengthening. You're actually not going to get significant strengthening or stiffening unless the length exceeds the critical length, sometimes by quite a lot. But the expression for the critical length is given here. It's sigma f times d over 2 times tau sub c. Here, sigma f is the fiber's ultimate tensile strength, d is the fiber diameter, and tau sub c is the shear strength of the fiber matrix interface. So for example, for fiber, uh, fiberglass, a common fiber length greater than 15 millimeters is needed, and a typical is one millimeter, might be, for the uh, critical length. For the longer fibers, the stress is transferred from the matrix more efficiently, and so you have a stronger material. So for a long, thin fiber, where the length is much greater than the critical length, then you have a high fiber efficiency, whereas if it's less than the critical length, then the efficiency of the fiber is much lower, and it acts kind of more like a particle composite um, when it's less than the critical length. Now when you place the... Um, fiber under longitudinal loading. Um, for a continuous fiber, for example, that means that um, it's a very long fiber and the, the uh, uh, axis of the orientation of the fiber is called the longitudinal axis. When you place it under that, you can get significant strengthening of your material. The expression for quantifying what the elastic modulus is is shown here. E is the elastic modulus and V stands for the volume fraction. So E for the composite material when it's under longitudinal um, is E sub CL and that's the elastic modulus when the composite fiber is under being loaded longitudinally and that's equal to E sub M times V sub M plus E F times V sub F. Here F stands for the fiber and M stands for the matrix. 
When it's loaded transverse, the fibers carry much less of the load, so the strengthening in the transverse direction isn't very much. It's actually a comparable expression to what the lower bound for a particle um, is, as we went over later. And that's shown here. For trans transverse loading, you have 1 over E sub C T, T here stands for transverse, is equal to VM over EM plus VF over EF. Now you can estimate what the elastic modulus for a composite for discontinuous fibers are. And this is valid when the fiber length is less than, say, 30 times the critical length, or 15 sigma F D over tau sub C. In that case, the expression looks like this. E, C, sub D, right? Here, E is the elastic modulus again. C stands for composite, and D stands for discontinuous, is equal to E sub M, V sub M, plus K, E, F, V, F. K is actually an efficiency factor that ranges between 0 and 1. The value is 1 when the fibers are all aligned and parallel to the longitudinal direction. And K is equal to 0 when it's aligned and perpendicular. If it's random in two dimensions, k is often 3 eighths, and if it's random in three dimensions, k is often 1 fifth, roughly. This is um, an expression for the tensile strength for discontinuous fibers. The tensile strength here is given by sigma. When the length is greater than the critical length, then sigma star C sub D is equal to sigma F star times VF, where VF is the volume fraction, and sigma F is the tensile strength of the fiber. And then we have that times 1 minus LC, where LC is the critical length, over 2L, where L is the actual length, plus sigma M prime times 1 minus VF. Now here, um, when L is less than the critical length, sigma sub C D star is equal to L times tau sub C over D times VF plus sigma M prime times 1 minus VF. Now here, the um, D stands for the diameter, of course, L stands for the length. Tau sub C is going to be the smaller of either the fiber matrix bond strength or the matrix shear yield strength. Um, and if I didn't say it before, the sigma M prime is the stress in the matrix when the composite fails. There's a few videos, too, actually, that I posted on composite production materials, and I really encourage you to watch it because it shows you what's happening inside the factory, and it's really pretty interesting. But one of the more common production methods for composites is called pultrusion. That's when continuous fibers are pulled through a resin tank to impregnate the fibers with a thermosetting resin. And then those impregnated fibers pass through a steel die that preforms it to the desired shape. And then the preformed stock passes through a curing die that's precision machined to impart the final shape and also heated to initiate the curing of the resin matrix. Now it's actually pretty cool looking when you watch the video, so don't let my rather dull recitation of the facts turn you off from watching it. Another um, common composite production method is called filament winding, and that's when continuous reinforcing fibers are accurately positioned in a predetermined pattern to form a hollow, usually a cylindrical shape. And the fibers are fed through a resin bath to impregnate them with the thermosetting resin. And then the impregnated fibers are continuously wound, usually automatically, onto a mandrel. And then after a number of layers are added, curing is carried out, either in an oven or at room temperature. And then they remove the mandrel to give the final product. And the animation of that um, in the video that I posted is, is really neat to watch. Finally, you're probably pretty familiar with structural composites. You've probably seen them around your house. They usually come in two broad types, and those are laminates, which are stacked and bonded fiber reinforced sheets. Sometimes they have a stacking sequence. Um, that gets discussed in the fi carbon fiber um, for aircraft use video that I've um, discussed, um, why they choose the stacking sequence that they do. But a really common stacking sequence is to orient, so the fibers are oriented this way in one layer, and then perpendicular to that in the next layer, and that provides them with increased tensile strength in either direction. They also have a more balanced in-plane stiffness, and they don't have that tendency to kind of curl up when they heat or cool that you might otherwise have. You've probably seen sandwich panels and ceiling tiles. That's a really common place to see them. And that's when you have a honeycomb core between two facing sheets. 
And the benefits are that they have a low density and they have a very large bending stiffness. So to summarize, there's a lot of benefits to composites. You can increase your toughness. You can increase your elastic modulus while decreasing your density of the material. And you can increase your resistance to creep, um, which strengthens their performance over time. So I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and be sure to watch all those extra videos that I posted below for more information. Thanks a lot.